Welcome to Lenovo Late Night IT, where we eat alphabet soup for breakfast. I'm your host, Baratunde Thurston, and the subject of our episode is the subscription economy. I'm joined by the man who coined the term subscription economy, Teen Zuo. Teen was an early hire at Salesforce, where he built the company's original billing system. He's since gone on to found Zwara, one of the fastest growing SaaS companies in the country. He's the author of Subscribed, why the subscription model will be your company's future and what to do about it. Also with us is Matt Kimball. Matt has 25 plus years experience working in areas ranging from hardware to software engineering, enterprise IT, and product management. Now he spent 11 years in AMD server business unit and was also an IT director for two different states, Florida and Oregon. Couldn't be more different, but he unites them. He's currently a senior data center analyst at the global consulting firm More Insights and Strategy. He's also the proud owner of a dog named Wallaford Theodore Franklin. Adorable. The dog's initials spelled WTF. Teen, Matt, thank you so much for being here. Good to have you. Thanks for having us. Teen, I want to start with you. Do you think we're moving toward a subscription economy? Oh, we, we are absolutely, absolutely moving towards a subscription economy. And you probably know this when you look at your credit card bill. I do. Yeah, when we need something, instead of reaching for a product, we're reaching to our favorite service. So, so moving towards services, Matt, I want to get your take on this. And you have a, a perspective of someone who's worked in these massive organizations, AMD, the state of Florida. Do you also sense that we're moving toward a subscription economy? Yeah, I would agree with Teen. Uh, you know, I look at the world through the lens of the data center and there is a a consumption model that is being driven across both hardware and software that is largely subscription-based. I suspect, team, that is, I know you're a strong proponent of this. You wrote a whole book about it and helping people do it. But what are the risks you see associated with becoming a more subscription-based economy? The subscription model is not about, like, you know, is it, am I better off if I own something? It's really about trust. You know, the vendors ultimately are going to want to earn your trust. Mm. And, and so I would say that this is probably the more natural business model, right? Oh, people and okay. people, you know, there's a trust and there's a relationship with services. Yeah. And the product model really introduced itself at the start of the 20th century with mass production. And we're really returning back to, you know, what makes us human, which is to know each other and to provide services to each other. It's the product model. Oh, you're good. Really is the you're model. good. Okay. So when we enter the subscription model, prices change. You know, features change. Yeah. The, the dynamic of that relationship can change. So, so Matt, how do you manage that change? Because it is such a different way of approaching operating a business when you actually no longer fully own uh, the capability that you need to be able to run your business. Yeah, I think there are a couple of ways of looking at this. And I would, I would agree with um, teen wholeheartedly in, in the, the notion of subscription-based. I think IT organizations understand the value that the cloud brings from a, uh, an agility perspective, um, but they're turned off by some of the large costs they see. So, you know, what is that perfect marriage of cloud economics and still having some control? And I think this is where subscription-based computing within the data center makes perfect sense. Um, I, I, I don't have enough data scientists on, on staff and enough IT st- uh, folks on staff to stand up a large analytics environment or uh, AI environment. So what if I went to an OEM, a server vendor, and bought their subscription-based service? You know, there are a couple of things that are, that are great there. I service the needs of my customers, my internal customers immediately or near immediately. Right. The, the server vendor or solution vendor manages that environment for me, so I'm not bogged down from an operational perspective, and I'm paying for it as I use it. So my costs should go down dramatically um, over time. So the, the question is, do I give up control at that point? Um, and that's really your question. I don't look at this as an IT organization um, giving up control over their environment or giving up uh, control over their data. I look at them leveraging, you know, a great team of experts um, from, you know, that are standing behind them, helping them have more control over their environments, quite frankly, um, and do the things that they're being tasked to do. But you have to have trust, like you said earlier. You have to have almost a level of faith, I think. One, that that, that provider, that vendor, that SaaS you know, partner is going to exist three years from now, now that you've become dependent on it, that they're going to maintain 
a sort of product development path that's still in line with your business growth or your household growth, and, and not, they're not going to pivot someday, like, oh, we don't do that anymore. That's right. How do you see the culture shifting within organizations, whether it's the CEOs, the marketing people, the various technology leadership around a subscription model? What does it do to the organizational culture? Well, um, the or it, 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 so to, to, to Matt's point, it, it obviously gives you incredible agility. Yeah. But I think there's a bigger picture for organizations, which is if you think about as an organization, you're starting to subscribe to all these services. Well, your organization also has a mission. Your organization has customers. Mm -hmm. And so your organization's customers are actually going through the same thing because this is all happening in our, in our personal right. lives. Right. And so what's going on in your organization right now is they're probably transforming to a subscription business. They're probably saying, you know, we have to turn our customers into subscribers. We have to transform as well. And so there's a broader thing. When we talk about shifting to subscription economy, this yeah. isn't just something that, that that's, you know, instead of buying software, I'll simply subscribe to some SaaS app or applications that I'll use the cloud. This is a whole economic shift in the world around us, and it's affecting the companies, and it's, it's actually creating new demands on IT mm. in today's world. I, I wholeheartedly agree, though. There are a couple of, couple of points in there. There's a, you know, there's a term that's used out in the, in the industry called digital transformation, right? And that is the digitizing of businesses in response to the market, which is, is huge and every company is going through it. But we talk about that in such an abstract way sometimes, we forget about the downstream effects within the, within the organization. And to what Tien said, you know, uh, as businesses transform, those IT groups that support them have to transform as well. Um, and, and I, I, I kind of take issue with that a little bit in that it's not that IT organizations have to transform, they have to do more. Their day-to-day -day jobs have not gone away, right? That break, fix capability or, or support that they provide to the organization, that has not gone away. Maintaining the envir operating environment has not gone away, but now they're being asked to do more in addition to that. And that's where, um, as I was talking about earlier, that's where subscription-based uh, or consumption-based computing uh, from the server all the way up to the software really can 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 uh, be used as a tool by IT to offload a lot of that those mundane tasks and allow them to reorient themselves to to what this new world brave world looks like right um, so I think that's a, a pretty big part of it a lot of this makes sense to me and and most people for digital goods digital services it's all ephemeral anyway but what about physical goods yeah. Am I going to be subscribing to mugs and index cards and pins and not own tables? You absolutely will. I know it's weird. I know it's a, it's a, it's a strange concept, but um, there's definitely some misperception out there that, that subscription services are really for digital. But the fact is that every single physical product is connected to the internet. Right? We're talking to companies that are building smart tables. Tables that actually Why sense. does a table need to be smart? It's a, it's a table. Well, so you haven't seen what engineers can design with these tables. And so imagine you're running a facilities, maybe you're running IT in facilities, and you want to know. You want to know how often your employees are coming to the office, using their desks, moving around. And what if your table, and what if your desks, what if your chairs can actually tell you all that information? Dude, you got to stop right now. Because you're describing the greatest snitch network I've ever heard of. My, my desk is going to rat on me. Well, we'll, we'll so, work through the privacy I was at the aspects. office, the table says no. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, but imagine that you can actually walk down to a table that says, I want to check into this table right now. I can put my fingerprint down, a computer monitor comes up, has all my applications on it, and it gives you the flexibility to move around in offices to offices. And oh, so, so what's happening now is, is because physical products have the ability to be connected to yeah. the internet. You buy a washing machine today, it's connected to the internet. How does a business decide it's not just about the customer ratings on the performance of the product, but yeah. it's about the reliability, the security, the, 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 the communication style of this provider because we're putting all of our businesses into these distributed financial relationships, all of our personal lives into those. That feels so different from the idea of like, but I own the bed, I don't own the bed anymore. I'm renting everything. Yeah. So I've got to trust the landlord a Absolutely. lot. How do you, how do you, find a way to that level of trust here. I'll, I'll give you, you talk about appliances. Mm -hmm. It's not really about the appliance. It's about the outcome that you're looking for. Clean clothes. Clean clothes, clean clothes. Yeah. So now, now imagine you're an engineer building a washing machine and it's a smart washing machine. Mm -hmm. And that washing machine is now collecting all the information. You're saying these customers are actually putting too much detergent. These customers aren't putting enough detergent. These customers are using a product 
completely wrong. And what your natural inclination is gonna do is gonna to wanna to take over more and more of that and actually deliver the outcome that the customer is looking for, which ultimately is clean clothes. And so you're gonna see the products that start to evolve yeah. towards these type of capabilities. And the business model that allows this to happen will be something like that. It will be some monthly service where you get clean clothes. And it's not just gonna be the washing machine, but it's gonna be all the stuff that goes on around the washing machine. You know, the fact is some folks may not want uh, their, their outcome to be uh, completely clean, right? They clean clothes. They might want something slightly different. And Dirty clothes. I do believe that it's not always the case where the customer is using the product wrong. They're just not using it as you envisioned it to be used. And the smart companies figure that out. And to what you said, it, it becomes more of a dialogue and there's a learning process. Um, and this is an age old, uh, age old uh, kind of uh, issue that product managers and software developers face all the time, right? I build a product for, for these specific functions and lo and behold, there are these edge cases that really aren't edge cases. They're, you know, they're, they're quite popular and you learn and you incorporate that back into your service. Um, but there is, a, there is a balance you have to strike between, between uh, driving to outcomes and understanding what those outcomes are and giving too much flexibility because before you know it, you're right back to square one where you're just making software and throwing it out there and its benefit is never fully fully realized. You use the word conversation, it's a dialogue. Yeah. And that's really what this digital transformation is about. If you can have an ongoing dialogue with each and every one of your customers. And now imagine that now coming back to IT, because what makes all this possible is technology. Yeah. And so what you're seeing is a shift in IT. There's a merging of say the CIO and the CTO function where IT is not just about you know, running a bunch of applications or running the infrastructure. IT has to be about how do I enable that ongoing dialogue mm. between my company all the way down to the engineers and my customers. So we're gonna take a little break. Uh, I want you all to get to know each other a bit better and also explain what you do. People in the tech industry sometimes forget that the average person has no idea what the hell they do. But I think even an IT expert should be able to describe their work in simple layperson's terms. That's why we created this next segment. You're going to explain your jobs to each other as if you were on a first date. You'll each have 20 seconds to make a good impression and hopefully lock down date number two. Get ready to spit some A game because it's time for date night IT. So you both heard the basic outlines of the game. Matt, I'm going to have you go first. You are at date number one. Put your best foot forward. Give team what you got. You got it. So uh, as, a, as an industry analyst, a tech analyst, I look at, uh, I, I try and marry the, uh, the knowledge gap that exists between solutions providers and IT consumers. Okay, Matt, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some, some pointers here. You opened with industry analyst which, you know, if I'm on a first date, that's not really gonna kinda loosen me up a bit, so you might wanna have a, a softer opening. Do you wanna give it another shot? I don't know that I wanna go on a date with you at this <laughs> point. Team, what were you about to say? Uh, I was looking at the dessert menu, you know. <laughs> Sorry, man. All right, let me try it again. Do it again, yeah. What I try and do is I, I, I try and uh, bridge the gap between technology companies and IT organizations to help IT organizations make more informed decisions around what they're going to deploy and, and use in, inside their data centers. Better? Team, was that better? Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I'm going to skip the appetizer, but, but I'll stick around for dessert. Sticking around for dessert. All right, well, that's good. Now you go from the judger to the judge, judged, perhaps? To judged. To judge teen, uh, shoot yeah. your shot. So Matt, you know all those services that you love? You use all these subscription services. I run a company that really creates some incredible software to make those things possible. All right, so you're too nerdy for me. Oh, 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 oh. I was still nerdy. Wow, and I was like, the way you said software, that got to me, Teen. Hey, you did, Teen, you did a great job. It just, uh, I'm looking for a little bit more in my, in my second date. All right. <laughs> Swipe left. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty and the openness to play the game. I'll take you both out separately. Team, you are on the record as being extraordinarily pro subscription. What do you want to own? 
I, I think we're actually witnessing the end of ownership. I'll, t- I'll tell you, like a couple of years ago, I saw this trend, this Marie Kondo trend. Yes. Right, where, hey, just go into your closet and just throw everything away, throw everything away. And at first I was like, well, that's, that's just got to be a strange fad. And then you look at your own house, your own apartment, your own closet, and you realize, you know, why do I have all this stuff? It's just, it just weighs you down. And so I just started throwing things away, just like everybody else. Do you own that jacket, team? Uh, if I could rent it, I would. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes, you own that jacket. My wife loves books. I'm a digital books person myself, but she wants the physical book. Where do you stand on books, team? You're an author. I, I do like physical books. Aha! We I got like em. physical books, but I'll, t- I'll tell you, I'll tell you, like, you know, number one question I get is, well, can I subscribe to your book? Ha ha. So we now have a weekly newsletter. We, we just continue the dialogue of the book, and we're actually collecting a bunch of things that might actually become a, a, a second okay. book. Okay, okay. So uh, you're getting high on your own supply. You're committed to the, to the movement. We're committed. And I respect the commitment. Matt, when you think about the death of ownership, or are there parts of the business world where you think ownership still is something worth preserving? I do believe that the days of owning your assets are long behind. Um, and you know that's kind of what made the cloud so interesting in concept to start and uh, so broadly adopted. And it's what's gonna drive consumption-based computing um, from, you know, from solutions providers across the spectrum moving forward. Matt mentioned enterprise organizations, which makes me think of the big ones, the Fortune 500 companies. What happens to the Fortune 500 companies in this transition to a subscription economy? The majority of the Fortune 500 companies, their business model is based on ownership. So you think about a car company. And you think about, so the last five or six years, the number of cars sold around the world is actually declining every single year, including mm. in, in emerging markets like, like, like China and India. Because we just, we don't need it. As a, you know, there's all these services out there. So if your business model is based on number of cars sold, then 10 years from now, you're going to be a smaller company, unless you just keep on increasing prices. But if your business model is based on miles driven, well, it turns out that miles driven is going up. And so the same time that we sort of seeing the end of ownership, we're actually using things more and more. We call, mm. this, we call this usership, right? Usership is going up and ownership is going down. And so I've got a friend, Ray Wang, that wrote a book, um, you know, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, and, and, and he estimates that 95% of, the, of, of today's Fortune 500 companies will not exist in 2050 because of this change. And so that is the big question that, that Fortune 500 companies have. How do I make this shift? Yeah. And if you're running IT in one of these organizations, you should be asking yourself, how can I help my organizations make that shift? How can I make sure that my organization is still one of the survivors yeah. in the year 2050? Matt, what is, in terms of making the shift, what are the hardest parts that you've seen? What's working well in the organizations that have been successful in making the transition? The biggest challenge is that IT organizations find in transforming operations, transforming the way they consume technology is all cultural. It's, it's, it's behavioral. It's we have done things a certain way for a certain amount of time. And there's a lot of discomfort and a lot of unknown on the other side of that transformation, which is what causes IT organizations to be, um, you know, I don't want to say they're loath to, to go through that transformation process, but, you know, not embrace it as quickly as they, they, they uh, would like. Tina had mentioned 2050, the Fortune 500 uh, looking vastly different. I think it could be much earlier than that, depending on the adoption of technology. How do you start thinking about ownership of the underlying behavioral and usage data that's part of the intelligence which drives the subscription product in the first place? Teen. I, I, I think it should be black and white. I, I think uh, anything that, that, that's about you as a, as a business or a consumer should be your data. We need to create regulations. So that's at a consumer level. Think about it as a business level, right? I have a whole lot of proprietary data that I'm generating on these servers. I have trade secrets um, you know, that I don't want my competition to gain access to. So if I'm getting consumption-based services from a large server uh, vendor or from a cloud provider that is on-prem, and they're using advanced telemetry to find uh, performance data and all kinds of monitoring of my, of my operations. You know, there's, there's also a fear that as, as that data goes back and feeds a large you know, ML farm or your inferencing um, farm cluster to provide better services out to all of their customers is some proprietary data being shared just around operations. 
um, that I don't want to be shared. I mean, there is there are so many so many different um, issues I think that really have to be kind of pulled back, and I hate to use the term unpacked, but unpacked and really explored um, as we start to as we start to move forward toward what really is an inevitable end, which is you know everything has a subscription. Teen, it feels like it keeps coming back to trust. I think buyers are getting smarter. I think buyers are getting smarter and they're certainly asking the right questions. They're doing their homework and, and ultimately the marketplace will decide the winners and the losers and the winners are gonna be the ones that can establish that trust and over time and, and understand that their reputation is always at risk and, and, and live up to that reputation. Mm. And so if you're a modern day CIO and you're sort of clinging on to these systems that you put in place for the last 20, 30 years and, and saying, look, I need to standardize, right? Because it's about scale and you're not really able to meet the needs of the business, then, then you're going to hurt the business. There's no reason why the CIOs of today can't be the CTOs and absorb some of that, all those cloud digital services that are not you know, to run a sales forecast, but to actually the service that the company is providing, the automobile service or the transportation service, the entertainment service, whatever it happens to be. There's no reason IT can't take that role. And this is where you know, IT as a service and consumption-based computing can be so important. There's also a skills gap that exists in these IT organizations. It's not just about you need to transform, you need to be able to transform. And if you can't do that, you're falling behind. And there are different levels to as a service, but if you can take these ready-made solutions that come down from IT solutions providers and stand them up as a service within your environment, you don't have to worry about all of that. That all goes to somebody else. And that's where the trust comes in. And that's how you allow your business to leapfrog the competition. That's what I love to, 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 to have the listeners realize, right? It's, it's, it, you, can, you can look at IT, you can look at the subscription economy and say, okay, the implication is, as, a, as an IT leader, how do I take advantage of these subscription services? Well, I think the next level is to say, how do I, as an IT organization, help my entire company transform into the subscription economy? And yeah. I think that's where the real gold is. I've been hearing from both of you, mostly the positive benefits of shifting to a subscription-based model. But one thing we haven't talked much about is the energy consumption of it. How do you think about the ongoing cost of replacing physical goods on a regular basis or keeping digital services alive so persistently given the climate crisis. Team? We do believe that it is a more sustainable world. What are you talking about, Team? I'll share a quick story with you. It turns out there's a firehouse in somewhere in California, and there's a light bulb that's been on for a hundred plus years. Wait, one light bulb? One light bulb. We can do that? We, so it turns out <laughs> we can do that. And it turns out that it used to be the electric companies would sell you light. If the light bulb went out, they would have to come, take it off, and replace it. And eventually they said, oh, we want to sell you electricity instead, and you buy your own light bulbs. Hmm. And all of a sudden, the lifetime of a light bulb started to shrink because these companies had an incentive for you to go back and buy more, more and more units light, bulbs. Of light bulbs. And yeah. so when you, when you leave all the use of resources to the vendor, the service provider, you actually wind up having a much, much better model. Teen Zwo, Matt Kimball, thank you both for helping me transform a bit in my understanding of this topic. I still want a dumb table, but I'll smart. We're gonna get up. you a smart table. <laughs> you, if you pay for it, then yeah, put it on your credit card. I'll try it out. I'll cover the first year. <laughs> and you guys can use that smart table on your second date. Aw, see, he remembered. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of subscription services out there. Some are so random, they sound made up to me. To prove my point, we're going to play a game called Dumb Subscribe. I'll describe three subscription services. Two are real, one is fake. Your mission, should you choose to subscribe to it, and the only answer is click yes, is to sniff out the fake one. Do you understand the game? I think so. All right, so here are our three services. Number one, Bacon of the Month Club from Bacon Freak. Oh, it's definitely true. Bacon Freak's Bacon of the Month Club sends its customers boxes full of bacon and bacon-related products like bacon jerky, chocolate-covered bacon, and bacon-flavored seasoning. It's bacon! All right. Subscription two, Ship Snow Yo. Starting at $49.99 a month, Ship Snow Yo will deliver a patch of fresh snow to you wherever you are in the U.S. The snow is sealed in a styrofoam <laughs> container to prevent melting and leakage. And number three, bless me, Father. 
Bless Me, Father is a monthly subscription service for Catholics who want to celebrate the ritual of confession, but remotely. Once a month, penitents confess their sins to an ordained priest who assigns penance over a secure video feed. To review, Bacon of the Month Club from Bacon Freak, Ship Snow Yo, or Bless Me Father. Matt? The Ship Snow Yo makes no sense on its surface. I don't care if you put it in styrofoam. It just doesn't make sense to me. So I'm gonna have to go with Ship Snow Yo as the, as the fake service. Teen. The snow thing sounds so ridiculous that it has to be true. Yeah. So I'm going to go with the Catholic priest over video conferencing. Okay, well this is interesting. Um, it's not bacon. Don't tell me the bacon. <laughs> <laughs> I like the suspense. You're like, please don't take my bacon away from me. I'm already signing up in the background over here. Um, bless me, Father is not real. And I'm sorry, but the snow thing is actually happening. That's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? You just did. <laughs> okay. All right. It's been a pleasure playing, hanging, and learning from all of you. Teen, Matt, Thank you so much for playing with me, for helping me transform, if not digitally, at least mildly in an analog way. It's been a pleasure. It was fun, thank you. We've got to lock up this garage now, but thank you for joining us. And thanks to our great guests, Teens Wo and Matt Kimball. I'm Baratunde Thurston, and I'll see you on the next Late Night IT.